Hi, I'm Christian Shelton. I'm a professor at UC Riverside. Uh, I work in artificial intelligence and specifically machine learning. And right now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, artificial intelligence, a little about the history, what it is, and maybe give some examples of, of the types of problems people in artificial intelligence work on or think about. Uh, so I think the first place to start would be what is artificial intelligence? Um, two words, artificial and intelligent. Um, so artificial, we're talking about something that's not uh, naturally occurring, uh, something that's created by humans, and so typically in artificial intelligence we're talking about a machine or a computer. Uh, you could imagine re-engineering biological systems, but generally we're considering computers. Um, and intelligent is actually the more difficult thing to define here. Um, often, uh, when we say intelligence, we mean human-like. Yeah, hum we define it by example. Uh, we believe that we're intelligent and we define intelligence as like us. Um, but that's a little difficult. So uh, there's a question, of course, of whether or not this has to be intelligent in the same way that a human is intelligent. Um, and that goes back to some, uh, some definitions that you might have about intelligence. So for example, um, if I asked if there were artificial creations that flew, uh, most people would say yes and point to airplanes or helicopters or things like this, things that human beings have created that fly. Um, however, if I asked, are there artificial creations that swim, uh, the question becomes more difficult to answer. Some people will say yes and point to a submarine or a boat, but others will say no. Um, they may go through the water, but they don't swim. By the word swim, you're really talking about a biological process or a particular way of achieving that goal of moving through the water. And so there's a question in when we talk about intelligence of the same thing. Do we mean intelligence in exactly the same way humans are intelligent, or do we mean something that's a little more abstract? Um, and there isn't a clear definition there in artificial intelligence of which one we mean. Okay, so it's a fairly broad field. Um, it's related to a bunch of other fields. Uh, mathematics, economics, psychology, neuroscience, uh, control theory, philosophy, linguistics, computer engineering. All of these things have a role to play about uh, what it means to be intelligent, what it, means, what it means to design an artificial system, all those sorts of things. So intelligent machines have been discussed at least for thousands of years. Uh, the Talmud uh, talks about a golem. Uh, which is sort of a precursor to a robot. Um, if you look at Homer's Iliad, it has depictions of sort of robotic creatures. Uh, Le uh, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan um, discussed this sort of thing. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci tried to create such sort of things. Um, uh, um, the first term, uh, robot, um, comes from a play um, in which uh, robots are depicted. And these were all well before uh, the time of computers or what you would normally consider artificial intelligence. So sort of as long as people have had thoughts about intelligence, people have had thoughts about artificial intelligence. Um, but the history of AI uh, usually is dated back um, to about 1956. So there were a few um, events that occurred before 1956. So in particular, in 1943, uh, McCullough and Pitts formed a model of a neuron. So you can think of this as, well, artificial intelligence, maybe I'd like to form a model of what happens in a neuron, and if I knew that, then I could put them together and create a model of a human brain, and that would be intelligence. Um, shortly thereafter, in 1950, Turing test came out, and this was a notion of, well, if we're going to talk about intelligence, what intelligence might be, um, and the Turing test is a test of whether or not a machine is intelligent, because it's a little hard to define. The test goes something like this. Um, Behind a screen, uh, there is either uh, a computer or uh, a machine, okay? Um, and the test administer uh, sits on one side of that screen and, at least in the 1950s, would type on a keyboard, let's say through a teletype, and communicate with what was on the other side of the screen, which would type back. So uh, we don't really have teletypes anymore, but think about this as an online chat. Um, situation. The, the test administrator is attempting to determine through asking questions and analyzing the responses whether or not the item on the other side is either a human or not. And if the, the if it can't, basically if, if it basically has to guess at random, so 50% of the time it gets it right, 50% of the time it gets it wrong, then the machine, which was, was sitting on the other side, or a human, but the machine in this case, um, is considered to have passed the Turing test. So this is a test of whether or not a machine can pass artificial intelligence, which if you put it behind a screen or you put a human behind the screen, someone sort of interacting with that machine can't tell the difference. And this was very much based on language. So you know, you ask things, can you compose a 
poem for me and things like this. See what you got back. There are limited versions of the Turing test that are sort of applied to machines. No one's really passed a full version of the Turing test. No machine has. But the true sort of start of the field maybe comes from 1956. So in 1956, there was a Dartmouth conference. It was titled Artificial Intelligence. Um, uh, this picture I have here uh, shows um, in 50 years later, five of the key members who were, who were still alive 50 years later. Um, and it, it sort of kicked off this work. And in fact, uh, Newell, Simon, and Shaw brought forth um, this logic uh, theorist, uh, which later actually co-authored a paper with them proving a theorem. Uh, it was denied because uh, the journal didn't think that a, a machine could take authorship of a paper. Uh, but it helped them prove something. And this, uh, this was a big, big thing then. And it kicked off uh, sort of the field of artificial intelligence, maybe uh, at least in that name. Uh, and so in the 50 plus years since then, maybe 60 years since then, um, things have progressed. So in the 1960s, uh, we saw great successes. Um, what's shown up here is an example of uh, basically some, some synthetic neurons, um, uh, a neural network. Um, down here you see a, a box world. Um, basically they're teaching machines, well, if it looks like this, could you reason about how to pick up boxes and put them on top of each other in order to achieve particular configurations or other things about those boxes. Um, and then uh, those were great early successes, and people thought, oh my goodness, we are, we are, we are close. Um, we will we'll, we'll be there uh, very shortly. Actually, what I'm showing over here um, is uh, Shaky the Robot, uh, who came out in the 1960s. Uh, people um, thought, well, we should really put all these things together. This is Shaky the Robot, possibly the most famous uh, real robot around. Um, and he could go move around, and he could decide how to push boxes out of the way and, and achieve various things in a, in a fairly simple set of rooms. Uh, it took a long time, and it had to communicate, which was via, well, it was Wi-Fi then, so it was very slow. Um, but it was an exciting advance where people had put a lot of these different technologies together. The 1970s are what's generally regarded as the AI winter. Um, the large successes from the 60s did not bloom into sort of... Uh, full successes later. So, for example, in the 1960s, uh, there was funding for um, translation uh, from Russian to English at the time. This was a very important problem. Uh, and it looked like they were very close um, because they could translate sort of simple things fairly well, but what proved difficult were the more complex things. So it's one thing to be able to translate each word individually or even maybe reorder sentences slightly, but it's quite another to be able to get the nuances uh, to be able to get something that looks fluent uh, in that other language. And that requires sort of a, a much higher level of artificial intelligence. It wasn't apparent in the 1960s just how big of a, a jump that would require. Um, and so when those successes didn't lead to the anticipated further successes in the 1960s, funding dried up for this field, uh, people were very discouraged. Um, this was generally considered the AI winter. Uh, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, we saw um, a resurgence in AI, primarily around neural networks and machine learning. Uh, we saw things like the No Hands Across America project, in which a car drove itself uh, from uh, New York to LA and appeared on the Today Show. And that's, of course, the standard for all, um, whether or not you've reached fame, is can you appear on the Today Show. Um, and neural networks like these, um, big computers um, that were designed, this is a Deep Blue designed to solve the chess problem, and, and a resurgence in the interest in AI. Uh, and today, or well, at least since 2000, uh, we've seen basically the incorporation of more data. So the one thing that was perhaps missing in the 80s and 90s uh, were a lot of data. Um, you can argue, argue that a, a child gets to be intelligent by observing things uh, many hours every day continuously, and that's a lot of data that comes in, and maybe this was the missing component. So, you know, things like um, Siri or other sort of um, agents that will, uh, you can talk with a little bit, these are really driven by large data um, uh, databases that can, that allow to find regularities in language and things like that. Um, IBM Watson is a search through large databases. Uh, AlphaGo is a recent success. That's mainly neural networks, not data. In um, Go playing, uh, we have self-driving cars uh, to a certain degree, and these all grew out of very large data projects. So AI has a number of sort of sub-disciplines, um, and what happened in the 1960s or so is you think about what I'd like to do is I'd like to build 
um, a, a robot that's, you know, uh, Data the Robot from Star Trek The Next Generation. That would be the idea. But you, you can't pose that as a five-year problem. Um, so you need to break off little pieces. You need to break off a piece. Well, I'm going to try to figure out how maybe we could take an image and figure out what the objects are in that image, right? So if I walk into a room, are there people here? Is there a desk here? You know, is there a soccer ball here? Those sorts of things. And I'm going to look at how we can communicate with it. How could I understand language? How could I understand intent? Um, and so on. So we can break it into a series of problems. And each of those has its own sub-problems. For instance, to understand language, uh, there are all sorts of things. Whenever I use a pronoun, can I figure out which pronoun or which actual object that pronoun was referring to. And even that's difficult because sometimes I refer to a pronoun, I use a pronoun when I discuss, but it's not even a noun that I had mentioned before in our conversation. It's a mutually understood noun. So there are all sorts of difficulties there. And so these, these sub-areas got their own sub-areas and grew into their own areas that had a, that had a reason for being, a raison d'être, that was not um, maybe AI itself. So, for instance, computer vision is useful even if you're not trying to design AI, if you want to do image search on the web, right? And so that whole field grew out. So you have robotics, which even if the robot isn't intelligent, it's in, uh, robots need to do various things. So you have robotics, you have computer vision, understanding vision. You have natural language processing, which has its own subfields. You have machine learning, which is how do I take historic information and change what I do in the future. You have game playing, things like chess and checkers and go and things like this, um, or more complex, maybe realistic games with, uh, you know, um, a nations positioning themselves in the global theater. Uh, you have theorem proving, logic manipulation, and you have general planning ideas. So all of these were their own subfields, and now people who work in those subfields, some of them consider themselves still part of AI, and that's why they're in the subfield. And some of those subfields, people working there don't consider it part of AI, it's its own field and they don't feel connected to uh, artificial intelligence because they have a, a different reason for wanting to work in that field. Uh, machine learning is one of those. So in machine learning, um, there are reasons that people come to machine learning just from statistics or from something else and don't don't come to it because it's because they're interested in questions of artificial intelligence, but because they're interested in different questions about data. So in fact, um, AI's had subfields like compilers. Uh, how do you uh, write programs and things like that? Or um, uh, other subfields, even some of the ones I mentioned before, like theorem proving or game playing, that are no longer considered part of AI because they are solved. Or at least it's viewed not as an intelligent thing, but a thing that naturally a computer would do. So one definition of the field of artificial intelligence is it's the study of all those things that you thought only a human could do and it didn't think a computer could. Now that's a self-defeating definition because now as soon as I get a computer to do something, everyone accepts, oh yeah, computers can do that, then it's no longer part of artificial intelligence anymore. But um, often that's sort of been uh, a practical or a, a, a definition of artificial intelligence. So what's the state of the art in artificial intelligence? Uh, in robotics, uh, self-driving cars, and obviously it's not completely commercially viable yet, but I, I think most people are familiar with sort of how that's progressing. Uh, you know, there's their examples, they don't work perfectly, they require some data, they require a lot of other things, but we have that. Um, in images, and uh, image understanding, um, if you look at uh, Google's image search, uh, that's probably uh, a reasonable sort of commercial product. There are things that work better in subdomains, certainly much better in certain subdomains, like I can search satellite imagery for particular uh, types of weapons or things like that, because uh, there's particular financial interest from defense agencies in doing that. Um, in speech recognition, Android's Assistant or um, Siri or things like this are, are um, about the general level if you're talking about um, phrases in a only slightly constrained context. Uh, if you're talking about phrases in a very constrained context, like ordering um, a plane flight or something like that, where the conversation is expected to follow a particular script, um, you know, you can do better. Uh, in planning, um, NASA um, has planning, that is, figuring out a sequence of actions that um, goes on, uh, for instance, a remote agent was on a um, space probe that went out to Jupiter and so, with the, the lag, um, that probe has to be able to think for itself. Right? Because it's not possible to, uh, you know, there's light. Light takes some time, you know, minutes and minutes, and sometimes hours to get there and back. Um, interestingly, the Department of Defense funded um, DART, which was a planning for logistics. Um, and it planned all the logistics of how to get things there for the uh, first Gulf War. And it's, um, they estimate that the amount of savings they had by having that done in a few weeks, as opposed to a bunch of logistics, uh, um, logistic planners do it over months, uh, uh, basically paid for all the investment uh, that the Department of Defense has put into artificial intelligence and planning um, ever. 
uh, which is quite a large investment. Um, information answering, you know, IBM Watson or even uh, you know your Siri assistant or something like that is um, is is about uh, is, is about at the current level. Um, language, um, you can go to Google's machine translation. Um, certainly, in a general broad sense, that's about the level. And then in game playing, you know, AlphaGo and Deep Blue are certainly the um, well. There's a one slightly better than AlphaGo now, but those are um, we have things that basically play Go and chess um, at the level of human beings, if not uh, quite a deal. A bit above. So in game playing, um, since that first early conference in AI, people were interested in how can we play games better. The idea being that um, this strategic interaction in a game uh, is indicative of intelligence. And so if we can study how to do that, maybe we've learned something about intelligence. And checker players were the first ones to come out. Um, and since then, uh, there's been a lot of there was a lot of attention on chess being sort of this thing. You think of if someone plays chess well, they are intelligent. So we want to mimic that. Uh, and uh, for the longest time, for, for decades and decades, e computer chess players were not on par with, uh, you know, human um, uh, grandmasters or even masters or something. So uh, your average a child who just picked up chess could be beaten by a computer, but anybody who had studied it um, could, could, could beat computers. Um, and in the 1990s, uh, IBM funded uh, Deep Blue a project, uh, built, built a, a machine that beat Kasparov. Uh, the uh, world champion. Uh, and I don't think that was anticipated at the time. Uh, I think maybe people who knew the project uh, you know, more knew, knew that it was going to happen, but certainly I don't think Kasparov anticipated it. Uh, and it was a bit of a, sh a surprise. And now um, uh, these sorts of machines are fairly commonplace. Uh, uh, machines that can beat certainly masters, but even grandmasters now. Um, we don't have competitions between uh, chess playing programs and human beings because it's not an interesting competition. Uh, we have chess playing programs that help human beings play better chess by letting them analyze, move, and do those, do those sorts of things. Um, but then, and so how did that happen? Uh, that happened by some advances in algorithms, some advances in understanding how you would play chess and how to reason about it, and it also happened by just really fast computers um, that could basically uh, consider lots of different possibilities very quickly um, and read away the ones. And it doesn't get tired, and it doesn't make a mistake, it just perhaps doesn't think long enough. Yeah. So chess is not a solved game, in that uh, we have not proven that if you start and both players play to the best of the abilities, it will always be a win for white, or it will always be a win for black, or it will always be a tie. However, um, computer players regularly beat human players. Um, since then, checkers has been solved. That is, with the same sorts of techniques, um, we've computed what the optimal solution is for both sides and what the result of the game would be if both sides played optimally. Um, throughout this entire discussion, people say, well, that's fine, but those are simple games, actually. So a game like Go has much more complexity to the possible positions of the board. There are many more ways that a Go board can vary. Uh, than, for instance, a chessboard. And so it's a much more rich space in which to think about strategies and a much more rich space. And um, I think through at least 2000s or so, people thought that really Go was a long way off to being solved. Yet, um, uh, just recently, uh, the uh, one of the uh, sort of best Go players was beaten by um, a Go program by Google, um, uh, the, the successor to AlphaGo. Uh, and I think... Um, this had been coming for a few years, but was a little bit of a surprise, and it shows that, and how did this happen? It happened by, again, a lot more compute power being applied. Uh, Google as a company has huge banks of computers to do all sorts of things, but some of them are reserved for projects like this. Um, and also a better understanding of how, maybe not to solve the game in this mathematical sense of if everybody played optimally, um, but how to sort of approximate through ideas from machine learning the various functions and things you need in there and get very good approximations uh, so that the resulting player can be quite good. So moving on, I wanted to give some examples of how, um, what are maybe the core fundamental problems or some of the core fundamental problems in AI? Um, maybe to give just a, if nothing else, a sense of the space. Um, so graph search is perhaps, if you took an AI class, this would be the first thing you would be taught. In fact, you might even be taught outside of an AI class, but it, since they are class. So there's a classic problem of, okay, I have, you may have found yourself in this situation. You have a boat, 
and you have a cabbage and a wolf and a goat. I know I've been there myself. And the boat will only go across the river if you're in it. And the boat is only large enough to take one cabbage or one wolf or one goat, but no, no, no pair of them at a time. You have a very peculiar boat. And you'd like to get all of three of the items to the other side of the river. The situation I showed in the bottom here. Okay. Um, however, if you leave the goat alone with the cabbage, the goat will eat the cabbage. And by the way, that's a bad thing. You don't want that to happen. And if you leave the wolf alone with the goat, the wolf will leave the goat. And again, in case you didn't know it, that's a bad thing. You don't want that to happen. And so you need to figure out some way of ferrying these things across. Okay? So you, this is the sort of like logic puzzle that you might see in the idea of how could we solve this with a computer that would give us some idea about how to, uh, what intelligence is, because solving this problem is an example of intelligence. Um, so the way to do is view these as sort of states of the world and think about the different actions I could take. So I could, for instance, ferry across the cabbage. Or I could ferry across the goat or the wolf. Or I could go across on my own and leave the three sitting there on the other side of the bank all by themselves. Right? Um, and in this particular situation, three of those will result in bad things happening because I've left the goat alone with either its food source or its nemesis. So. Um, so I don't have to consider those. I can just consider this one thing that's left. But from there, I have some options. I could, so in this case, I've gone across with the, wolf, uh, with the goat. And I've left the wolf and the cabbage on the other side because the wolf is, um, is a carnivore, so this is okay. And I could then, for instance, go back with the goat, put me back in the original position. Or I could go back alone. Yep. Um, and if I go back alone, then I have the choice of what I could do then. Okay. And this keeps branching into a variety um, of different situations that we represent in the computer. And I'm looking for essentially a path through these situations, ones that are legal, that ends up in this final situation I'm interested in. Now, this is a very simple problem. There are only 16 possible states, those are these situations. And so the search doesn't take much time, but it gives you the general idea. That's a graph search problem. Um, you could use it to solve the Rubik's Cube, for example. So the previous one had 16 states. This one has 43 quintillion states. So clearly, I need some, I'm not going to represent all of those states inside of a computer. Even though computers are big, we can't represent 43 quintillion of anything. Um, uh, but you can imagine, here's a cube, and then I'm going to, I'm going to move it this way, or I can move it this way, and after that I can move it this way, this way, and go through that whole thing. And we've designed algorithms that can figure out maybe better ways of going through this tree, or, or prune off certain, now that, that thing couldn't possibly help, and such like that. So that's graph search. Um, graph search, um, sort of, if you're interested in graph search, uh, it's related to A star search, is maybe the fundamental algorithm here. Um, and it's related to a number of other sort of uh, research topics in this area. It's used in things like um, driving directions. Uh, that's how you get maps. Uh, um, VLSI layout, this is the layout of circuits on a chip. You try to figure out, well, could I plot, where should I, I want an adder and a multiplier and something else on my chip, and then these have to communicate this way. How do I lay those little paths out on my chip so that it all fits you know, in some piece of silicon. Um, uh, assembly sequencing in factories, uh, protein design. I want to figure out how this molecule, what its conformational search could be so that it could fit onto this molecule uh, for drug design, uh, robotic path planning, uh, things like that. Um, simple projects would be things like uh, uh, checkers, for example, or minesweeper. Um, from a different idea, uh, maybe I'm interested in robotics. So what's an example of robotics? Well, I've simplified a robotics problem way down. So here I have a robot. Um, and the robot can be one of eight different positions in my building, let's say. Uh, and the gray lines just represent the boundaries between the positions, but the black lines represent walls. Okay, so here are some problems in robotics, just to give you a flavor of what might be interested in. So here's an example of there's that robot, and then that robot senses something. Okay, so maybe the robot senses what walls are around it. Okay, so this is the uh, representation of its sensing. It gets, is there a robot, is there a wall to the north, is there a, is there a wall to the east, the west, the south? Um, this could be more general, to general sensing of the robot. Um, and then it moves, okay, so it moves along, and then it gets another sensing, okay, and then it moves again, and then it moves again, and then it finally moves again. Okay, so this is what's happening in the world. But the problem is usually I only see the sensing sequence, and I'd like to reconstruct where the robot was, or at least know where the robot is right now. So this is the, the what's called a localization problem. I have a map of the world. And what I'd like to do is, based on the sensing readings I've seen so far, figure out where the robot could be. All right? um, but the problem is those sensors aren't actually perfect. Um, so there's some chance that the sensor will report the wrong thing. 
Okay, so now, if you look at this sequence here, there's actually no sequence of moves that would have generated that sequence of sensor readings exactly, and that's because those sensor readings have been corrupted by noise, and I need to be able to process this. So I don't, I don't know for certain where I am, but I need some probability distribution over where I am that describes my uncertainty as it's related to those, um, to those noisy measurements I've made about the world. So the way, one example of how this might work, a very simple example is, well, if I know I start in this uh, northwest corner, right, um, then if I move, I can say, well, there's some chance when I move, by the way, when I move, there may be some error too, when I move, there's some chance I'd end up over here or here. And then given that I end up in each of those positions, I can say, what's the chance I would have seen this particular wall configuration? And the answer is you wouldn't have seen it in any of them, but it's most likely in sort of the lower uh, the, the southwest corner there, right? So we, we place more probability distribution there. And then I continue this as I move and I sense things, I update a distribution over where I think I am using the laws of probability. And by I, I mean, of course, the robot. Um, and then in the end, I have some distribution, for instance, like this. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> um, this, the, the sort of models that are used here, I just described is basically what's called a hidden Markov model. It's also used in uh, genomics, and it's used in, in, in speech recognition and a wide variety of other things. Um, most of robotics and a lot of AI now deals with probability and statistics. Um, another example of what I just showed would be the Kalman filter, if you're familiar with control theory. Um, these things are used in, obviously, robot navigation and DNA analysis, as I said, for hidden Markov models, um, video analysis, spe uh, speech to text, uh, protein folding, um, all these sorts of things. Uh, rely on that kind of analysis there through probabilistic methods. Uh, the last sort of problem I'll describe um, is one from computer vision. So uh, you might take a picture like this and your f phone or camera automatically like highlights all the faces in there because faces are important to human beings. We'd like to know where the faces are. Um, I guess I imagine the future computers could highlight the computers in an image, but um, we're not there yet. Um, or I might take a picture like this and like to know, is there anyone outside my house right now um, at night? Yep. Or I might take a selfie and want to count the number of people in that selfie. So all of these are situations where you'd like to be able to identify and place uh, where are the uh, faces in an image. So it works like this. If I have a picture like this. Um, how does this work? Well, I'm going to take a little window of that picture, um, and I'm going to basically crop it out of that picture and say, is this a face? I'll ask, somehow I'll write a little piece of program that'll determine whether the face it says, no, that's not a face. And then I'll slide it a little bit, in this case, to the right. Um, and I'll ask, is this a face? And it will say no. And I'll keep sliding it like that until I grow all the way across the top row, and then all the way across the next row, etc. And I'll find any place that says it is a face. So if I get over to this position here, I'll feed that little box in, and it will say, yes, that's a face. Okay. Um, this one here will say, no, that's not a face, as an example. Now, if I want to find faces at different sizes, I just rescale the image. So the box remains the same size, but I rescale the image. It's equivalent to rescaling the box. But now my little, is this a face piece of code has to only look at uh, boxes or snippets of the image that are the same size. Okay, so that's great. I've engineered the solution down. Now I just have to write this little function that basically takes in a piece of an image and tells me if it's a face. Um, and that's hard. Um, if you ask a typical computer programmer, how would you know if an image were a face or a cat or a dog or something else you're interested in? It's not clear how to do that. Um, this is, in fact, what the computer looks at. That's some piece of the image there, and each pixel in that image is represented by a number, and there it is. And so you can ask yourself, do you think that's a face? Um, turns out it looks like this, and now, now you can say that, yes, that is a face, because your brain has circuitry, it's in the back of your head, generally, moving forward, that works really well in images, but it doesn't work so well in just like raw numbers to be able to make sense of it, okay? Um, so that's, that, that, is, that is a face. Um, here's a different one, you know, do you think that's a face? Yes, it is. It's a darker face uh, in, that, in that the lighting is not as bright on that particular part of the image, but it is also a face, okay? Um, so we need a function that maps images onto faces, and that's hard to write. Um, but we can give it examples. I can give it a whole bunch of examples like this. So this little image patch is not a face, and this one is a face, and this one is a face, and that one's not a face. I can give this as a large data set. You can just go through images and pull out all the different faces, and there's a human being, and throw those, ex throw those as examples. And then anything I don't say is a face is clearly not a face. Okay. 
And so that brings us to sort of a machine learning problem, which is I give you some examples, but I don't tell you exactly what the function is. And now I'd like you, I'd like you, you being the computer, I'd like the computer to come up with a general function that will map um, inputs to output, so face uh, images to whether or not it's a face, uh, and that that function needs to generalize. That is, it can't just work on the examples I showed it. It's supposed to work on unseen future examples. Okay, so faces are difficult to describe, so let me describe this maybe in terms of an insect example instead. So in uh, machine learning, we're trying to map, uh, you know, something we've measured, so an input, an image, something we've measured or something, onto an output, which is uh, maybe, is it a face, is it not a face, is it a grasshopper, is it not a grasshopper, something like that. Um, and so the inputs are called the features, and the output's called the label, or the class in this particular case. So here's an example. Um, maybe it's purely fictitious. No insects were actually harmed in the creation of this data set. Um, so maybe I've measured, hypothetically, the wing beat frequency and the mass of some various insects. Okay, and the blue ones are, you know, one type of insect and the red ones are another type of insect. Okay, and so in two dimensions, if I just measure two things, I can plot that. And as a human being, you could draw a line or something else. Um, in general, I've measured usually many more than two things, right? If I have an image that's 16 pixels by 16 pixels, each of those pixels is a measure of the amount of light that fell on a particular part, and so I have 256, 16 times 16, different measurements, right? Here I only have two different measurements, so the problem is easy, but I have two so I can show it to you because I can't show you something in 256 dimensional space. So, um, in this case, what we're looking for is some rule. So, in this case, there's a, the rule is a line, and it says everything on one side of the line is of type blue, and everything on the other side of the line is of type red. Right? Um, so, that means if I give you a new insect that has, and I measure its wing beat frequency and its mass, um, then that corresponds to some point on this space, and then the rule will tell me should that be blue or should that be red, and I've generalized from those examples to a general rule. Here's a more difficult one. Maybe I've measured something else crazy about, um, again, uh, hypothetical insects. Uh, and so maybe I'm looking for a more complex rule in this case. Or maybe I'm not. Maybe that's too complex a rule and I've, 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 I've messed up the problem. But I could be looking for more uh, complex rules like this. Okay. Um, so that's the general way uh, machine learning enters into problems. Uh, usually there's some transformation, like in that image problem. I want to find the phases. I first transform into the problem of sliding a window. Um, across an image, and for each window in the image asking whether or not it's a face. Now I've transformed into a problem of this binary classification problem, and then I bring in machine learning to solve that binary classification problem. Uh, these sorts of techniques are using credit card fraud detection. So they have large databases of credit card transactions, ones that were fraudulent, ones that were not, features about each, uh, medical diagnoses, uh, satellite imagery analysis, uh, machine translation actually uses this as core component inside, um, online advertising, uh, trying to decide which ads, if I put them up next to your uh, web search, would result in you clicking them or not, um, brain computer interfaces, um, all these sorts of things rely on that. So um, that's, those are some examples of AI. It's a fairly broad field, um, I think. Almost everyone who works in AI works in some subfield and really identifies pretty closely with that subfield. Um, what are the current challenges in AI? Uh, I'll give you some examples. So um, there's a current challenge of going from what's called signals to symbols or syntax to semantics. Um, so think of those images. The images come in as signals. They come in as um, you know the amount of light that falls on a sensor in particular places, um, and we do a lot of basically very fancy signal processing to get more signals out. Is this a, um, is this a dog? Is this a cat? Uh, is this a person? Whatever else. Um, where we think, and we may be wrong about this, we think the human brain at some point um, talks about symbols. I talk about this abstract level of symbols. I talk about um, people. I talk about, um, you know, our, our whole language is practically symbols, right? They're these discrete symbols we put together. Where do those things connect? And it's not that no one has any ideas about this, but this is a, a current interesting topic. Um, there's the notion of safe exploration. Um, so that is, if my robot, or whatever my artificial intelligence is, has to go gather its own data, like small ch children do to some degree, um, how do I gather data and get 
examples of lots of interesting things without essentially killing myself off in the process. And I have to have some notion of what I shouldn't be going and collecting data about before I even know what the effect is. So how do I do that kind of generalization? Um, I think there are issues about being social. Um, it's not quite clear what you would want in artificial intelligence in terms of social. Not, not enabling humans to be social, but the artificial intelligence itself being social. Um, should it be social in the same way as human beings? Should it be social in a different way? Uh, and then finally, um, there are clearly a lot of uh, issues right now about the oversight of artificial intelligence as a technology. Uh, my personal view is that that's actually not very different than many other technologies. It's just perhaps uh, currently a little more scary and a little less understood. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, a table saw is a pretty dangerous uh, tool. Uh, and when I use a table saw, uh, um, I'm very careful about how to use it, and I understand how that table saw works to some degree. I don't understand exactly how that blade is coming up and throwing off pieces of wood, but I do have an operational understanding of when I use the table saw and I do this, it's going to kick the wood that way, or if I do this, my thumb could go through the table saw, things like that. And I think the average person doesn't have that same kind of understanding about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is, I think, more complex than the average table saw, um, but that needs to be built up with any technology um, and there are risks. There are risks with table saws. You should not let children on table saws. You should not use a table saw unattended. Um, you know, these, these sorts of things. And the same thing has to be developed for artificial intelligence. So anyway, that's a broad overview uh, of AI as a field, its history, maybe some ideas of what, what it, how it tries to think about things, um, and how it is involved in a bunch of different sub-problems. I hope you enjoyed it.